All right, hello and welcome to Lifestyle Business. I'm Anne. And I'm Chris. And we are so happy to be here with you today. Our last episode before the holiday season begins. We're going to have a quick bonus episode after Thanksgiving, but uh, we're getting into the Thanksgiving spirit. Yeah, very exciting. Thanksgiving exciting. sheltered in place, of course. Yes, thank, no travel Thanksgiving. No travel Thanksgiving. Uh, although we've been, been doing a little bit of travel uh, pre-Thanksgiving to see our family and friends, but um, looking forward to a Thanksgiving week next week, and uh, we have a lot to be grateful for, don't we? We do have a lot to be grateful for, and it's going to be a good week. I mean, it would be nice, a little bit quieter around. Uh, I'm sure everyone's been reading up on the safest way to have Thanksgiving. You know, the uh, Dr. Fauci piece today in uh, the New York Times, uh, it was, he said, test and party. Test and party. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he, he said, you know, it's interesting. It's not, you, you're, it's impossible to mitigate and eliminate all risk, but um, and obviously you want to minimize large gatherings, but, uh, he did put some credence behind, um, if you are getting together with a group of people, you know, do a test, uh, there are tests available. In fact, that Y Combinator company has a home testing kit. Yeah. When we're going to get that. And Pfizer and now uh, it's the other company, Moder Moderna announced, uh, 95% efficacy on their vaccines. When are we getting those? Come on. It's you know, Trump's focus. Trump, right Trump's going to get it done. Yeah. That but, and he's speeding up chickens. Yeah. So um, that is true. But, you know, I think Fauci also asked for a uh, nationwide approach to this. And I know several folks have sort of gotten frustrated by that concept. They, they think it's just, you know, because it is a scandemic. Scamdemic, remember? We learned that. It's so ridiculous. Early on. Ridiculous. <laughs> and, but well, what was interesting, he was calling for sort of a, a nationwide, and I think that is important exactly because of your test and party comment. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think any of us actually know whether or not what the actual protocols for test and party would actually be. And so if you had sort of like scientists dictating what the best and most safest approaches would be that it would be a lot easier. For example, let's say you went on an airplane and you were it, you were exposed to the virus and then the next day you tested and party, but the virus hadn't shown up. I don't actually know if that means that you're just asymptomatic or if you've tested negative that you can't actually pass. I mean, it's just, there's a lot of morass of details. Or you take the test and then you get the results two days later, but actually the virus has shown up in your system it's just very complicated and so it is sort of true that maybe a consistent message that we could follow and protocol would be not so bad well not the purpose of today's show wear a mask don't go to bars he said he <laughs> said awesome. he said the the worst place you can possibly be is an indoor bar uh, I like to know him that he likes a beer and a burger. He does course. like a beer and a burger. Anyway, <laughs> enough about Fauci. Seriously. Um, do you want to uh, do our gratitude exercise? Oh, yeah, yeah. We decided for this week's uh, broadcast in advance of Thanksgiving, we're going to share five things that we're each grateful for since we won't be doing a Thanksgiving episode since a week from today is Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Five uh, things, who, just five. Who wants to go first? I've got five. How many do you have? <laughs> well, I decided to do my gratitude exercise, and it's a full page. You I mean, a lot to be thankful people for. never expect me to be able to focus on writing down a full page of stuff, a full page of things that I'm grateful for. So I have so much material that I can choose from. Let's let you go first, and then I can sort of second some of them in case, and then I can get, get to mine as well. All right. Because All right. you only have five. I only have five. Uh, they're right here. Here we go. All right. All right. Number one, uh, I'm grateful for uh, my health, our health, our family's health. I think this is a year to be grateful for uh, your health. Uh, there, there are so many people that have been sick, and we've lost so many people. We've lost people in the launch pad community. So the fact that we're healthy right now, relatively, I have a little bit of gout, <laughs> but I can deal with that. 
um, oh, grateful for my health, party. number one. Uh, number two, uh, I'm grateful for the resilience of our team and our company. Uh, we're going to talk to Savitri in a minute about resilience as well. Um, but uh, in uh, this crazy year, um, the fact that cockroaches were still around and were still alive um, is is something to be grateful for. Um, and uh, our team's been through so much. Uh, we've been through a lot as a company and grateful for our customers and everything. The fact that there's a resiliency to our business. So that's number two. I think you could have summed that up by I'm a cockroach. Cockroach. We're cockroaching. All right. Number three. Uh, I'm grateful that we get to have a home where we'll be for Thanksgiving. <laughs> okay. I got that one. Yeah. My uh, house didn't burn down. That's what I wrote. Yeah. Our, our house didn't burn down, uh, which is great. Uh, and um, so our neighbors did, unfortunately. And a lot of people... Uh, in Louisiana and other places have been hit by hurricanes. So just, you know, having shelter and a place to be uh, is something I'm grateful for. Uh, number four, um, I'm grateful for our community. Um, and in so many different ways, uh, sort of our, our immediate family, uh, we've been to visit our parents and um, sisters and cousins and nieces and nephews and godparents uh, in the last couple months. Um, and, and that been, is very unique to be able to do that. We, yeah, been, been, been able to, you know, take some risks, take some precautions, travel. Uh, we evacuated from home, so we sort of were forced to. <laughs> uh, while we were evacuating, we had um, our community here in Healdsburg take us in. We stayed with people while we couldn't be at home. Um, Zach and Mandy, um, and uh, we've had an amazing year with our really good friends uh, here in Healdsburg, and uh, have been here a couple of years, but really feel part of the community here this year. So um, I get to check that one off my pod. Okay, our pod, our pod. Grateful for you, pod. Um, and then number one, I'm grateful for our family. Aww. I'm grateful for you, Anne. Uh, I'm grateful for our daughter Harper, and uh, that is uh, that's the most important thing in my life, and uh, so something that we'll be thinking about and very grateful for next week during Thanksgiving. Well, that's very nice. Those are my five. Good. I I Let's crossed I 50. crossed I crossed over on a lot, so I I don't have that many. Um, but I'm going to start with after uh, spending every moment together for this year, I mean, really always, um, that when we were hanging out recently, we were talking about how um, Harper is really the only person in the world who wants to spend all their time with me. Mm -hmm. uh, and you said, actually, no, I like spending all my time with you, too. And that was very nice. So uh, I'm grateful that you still like hanging out with me. Um, I am also grateful that we did get to see family and I recognize that that's not easy. So it's like, you know, make the best of it. We were out of our home. It didn't burn down. So that's good. But you know, that kind of forced us to get out. Um, and so as a result, we were able to make that happen, including yeah. a two week quarantine in Canada, which was really good because honestly, we didn't think we'd ever, we thought it'd be another year or so before we saw my family. So that was very, I'm very grateful to that. Um, the third thing is I'm grateful that we have a two year old. First of all, I'm grateful for Harper, but that she's two. And so she has taught us that we should be taking step back and keeping everything in perspective and not worrying so much about the fact that we're on the, the business is kind of struggling, <laughs> um, and everybody's struggling. And so she's sort of saying like, I don't, let's, keep it all in perspective and have some fun because she's only going to be two. She's still going to be going to school someday soon. And so it's like been good to help us really have perspective. Soon. Uh, hmm. <laughs> Maybe never. Um, and it is interesting because that changed my mentality around a lot of things. So that I'm grateful for her in terms of a shift in my perspective. I'm grateful for Dio. 
um, who's yes. our VP of operations because she showed up um, just at the right time and has been really helping us steer the ship during this time and and uh, working with us and sticking with us. And I know that our communities are very grateful to have Tayo back. Um, I think, and then um, just, you didn't say it, so I'll add it and then I have an extra, which is I'm grateful that Joe Biden is president, <laughs> was going to be president. And finally, I am grateful that the world seems to be getting better at slowing down, looking for less instant gratification, and is generally consuming less. Good. Uh, I think it's kind of nice. Yeah. Oxygen. We can breathe. Yeah. That's my gratefulness. Okay. Um, also, Bubble Guppies and Pete the Cat, but no. <laughs> Let's move on. Grateful for those. Let's on, move on to the, uh, the meat Harper. and the potatoes. Uh, so coming up, um, we're going to uh, welcome to us before we get into our member magic. You're going to do member magic first? I am. Okay. I'm just going to tell people who we're going to be talking to so they can stick around about right. member magic. Uh, we are going to be welcoming Savitri Wilson. She is the founder and CEO of technology startup Brasilia, a startup that we ourselves have used. Um, the company has raised over 10 million in venture capital to date and revolutionizing how nonprofits uh, are created and maintained. In fact, she helped us with the Launchpad Foundation. That's right. I know. Right. And it's great because, um, honestly, the whole world of nonprofits is challenging and very, somewhat difficult to navigate. So, being able to navigate the legalities and the elements of starting one, um, making that easier is great because the rest of it is very hard. Um, so let's get into our member magic. Go ahead. Why don't you talk to us about New York? All right. So uh, with our member magic this week, um, it was announced that our Launchpad member in Newark, Tiffany Leach, the budget yes. has signed her first major book deal with Penguin Random House. Her book entitled Get Good With Money, 10 Simple Tips to Becoming Financially Whole is set to drop in March 2021. Um, visit ggwmoney, getgoodwithmoney.com to learn more or the Budget Nista uh, I, on Instagram. I'm pumped. I could definitely use the Budget Nista. I'm pumped for the book. And we're coming for you to be part of the Launchpad TV for your book launch. I think there's – March is going to be a good month for books. It's going to be a good month for – oh, is it? <laughs> I can't wait to We'll see. learn more coming up. T TBD. Uh, former member Mars, close to my heart. Yeah. Um, our first corporate member, which was very exciting, uh, went, reached acquire to uh, reached a deal to acquire Kind. Yum. I like Kind bars. I do too. Which makes its own nutritional snacks as a move to expand the candies makers snack menu. Um, we are super okay. That's, Everybody's getting healthy here. Getting healthy. Mars is even getting healthy. They're like. Snack on the m ms once a week, but have a kind bar every day. There we go. I can't wait. All anyway, right. excited for you guys. And we are excited to co-sponsor our Newark member, D. Marshall's conference, Win Rock Rule, uh, this year. Um, and you've been to that. I have. Uh, usually, it's an in-person event uh, that convenes women from across the country to harness the power of networking and produce results. Uh, this year, the event will be hosted virtually at Launchpad Newark. Um, so you can be, you can grab a ticket by visiting winrockrule.com and, and we'll put all those links. It is uh, an amazing, uh, event. D is like just a powerhouse in terms of inspiring, active conversation. Yeah. She's um, awesome. I remember being there and, uh, just being overwhelmed by the excitement. Yep. Uh, so that's good. So quickly. And then Stockton. Oh, Stockton on my mind today. So let's get to the member magic, which is Suki Shamra, Seeds Director, was recently mentioned in a Nation Art and the, the Nation article focused on Stockton's guaranteed basic income. And Stockton is a big leader in driving real examples of how a UBI can be impacted. And we had Mayor Michael Tubbs on recently to talk a little bit about that with Scott Sims. And he is a huge driver of universal basic income, a tireless uh, worker. Uh, around sort of helping to reinvent Stockton um, and really shining a light on the power that universal basic income can have to us. And, and this is not member magic per se, but some disappointing news out of Stockton, at least from our point of view, um, Mayor Tubbs was not reelected. Um, kind of a shock, 
right? I think it was, yeah, I think it's sh it's a shock to many people in the city. I think it's a shock for those of us who have been, who were attracted to Stockton because of his uh, amazing leadership. Yeah, but I guarantee you not the last we will hear from Michael <laughs> Tubbs. Uh, he is truly a powerhouse. Um, he's what, I don't know if he's 30. He's 30 now. Uh, he's got a bright career ahead of him, whether he chooses to uh, stay in Stockton, stay in California, or I'm sure there's many, many places, many people uh, thinking about adding him uh, to their lineup right now. Yeah, so and in, our, in one of our comments to Michael, we were sort of saying that we use Stockton as an example of the kind of uh, government, the kind of engagement that you want to see that really does make wholesale real change in the city. And so um, that is a lot because of the way he leads and the way he manages that. And it's a complicated town yep. uh, and it's exciting to go. And I also think, you know, we've been chatting a lot about we always talk about different markets and things like that. And some of these smaller markets, um, I think one of the frustrating things we see is this idea of wing clipping. And we see it when it comes to investing in founders and we're seeing it in government. And the reality is, is that, and sometimes we talk about it in Canada, but reality is, is, is that, you know, as, as people's stars rise, it's actually an amazing thing for the communities. And so what we want to do is we want to help all stars rise um, across this great country and that just makes your city be better because you've got a rising star and so let's go to the rising star of the New Orleans ecosystem right all right here we go Why don't you bring her Wilson. And, yeah all right named a rising star oh my god I didn't even see that star on the Forbes cloud 100 list Featured in Inc. Magazine's 100 Female Founders Building World Changing Companies, recipient of the Nobel Prize for Public Service, and a number one seller on Amazon for her book Solid Ground, How I Built a Seven Figure Company at 22 with Zero Capital. Savitri so Wilson is a disruptor with a conscience, and it makes me feel very unaccomplished. Uh, she is here today to share her insights from her story, personal and professional journey in the mostly male nominated world of tech. Uh, no, dominated, yes, uh, world of tech, and speak to us about how the work she's doing is making a place at the table for black female founders. Welcome, Savitri. Wow, I um, amazing. Hi, thank you for having me. So great to have you here. And um, are you uh, are you joining us from from New Orleans right now? I am. Ironically, when we um, in January, we had just opened up a second office in New York and then everything shut down in March. Um, and so I was splitting my time between um, here, New Orleans and New York, but with everything with COVID, New Orleans has definitely been my uh, safe place. <laughs> That's great. Well, um, it's uh, it's been in incredible to follow your journey over the years um, from you know some of the, the Idea Village, uh, NOE events to, uh, your seed fundraise to your recent eight million dollar fundraise. Um, you know, Resilia is doing great things, and and you're an incredible CEO. Can you just you know talk to us a little bit about your journey and and what it's been like these last few years? Um, absolutely. So I, um, as you alluded to, with the name of my book that I self published on um, Amazon. I started my first company in 2009 called Solid Ground Innovations, and we were essentially a strategic communications and management agency, um, but we had an arm that actually catered to nonprofits um, and essentially large grant makers, so like your Ford Foundations, your Kellogg Foundations, and we essentially would provide technical assistance to their grantees and those projects that they funded, as well as find them new interesting projects um, and organizations to fund. Um, as that company began to grow, I realized that we could no longer serve the smallest nonprofits the way we were doing in a professional services um, capacity. We didn't have the capacity internally. And so I began to think about ways we could productize our services and deliver it through a software solution. And that gave rise to what was originally called Exempt Me Now, doing something, as you all remember, um, helping expedite the process of incorporation and exemption for nonprofits across all 50 states. And we have, even since we probably, um, started your organization, um, drastically improve and enhance and automate a lot of the features so that people, as we say, can do it themselves but not by themselves, utilizing our software. 
uh, we rebranded to Resilia and introduced two additional products, um, our nonprofit platform for existing organizations, and then our enterprise platform for those who deploy capital. So going back to the very early stages of my first company, we were working with those grant makers, as I mentioned, and so now we've actually created a product for um, government entities, public charities, private foundations, and corporations who are deploying capital. Wow, that's amazing. Um, one of the big questions that often comes with these sort of large organizations is they often take time um, to sort of come around to different ideas. And, and <laughs> I mean, in software, we often talk about enterprise level sales, and that takes a long time. In the nonprofit world, it seems like it takes an even longer time. Yeah. Um, how do you recommend sort of early uh, entrance into the nonprofit space to get started so that they can start to kind of build that timeline and actually be able to connect with those large organizations? Well, now is definitely the time we've actually been on the more fortunate side of businesses during this, um, during 2020 and COVID and everything being locked down because we've seen essentially unprecedented philanthropic giving, and we've seen so many new funds being set up, um, whether that is for BLM, whether that is for COVID-19 funds, and uh, faster than has ever happened, the world has had to digitize, and the nonprofit space was not left behind from having to do that. And so now we're talking to leaders, like, how do we bring training online? How do we... Um, do you know we're people are utilizing we're utilizing Zoom for the first time and ironically in our nonprofit platform and in our enterprise platform the whole entire purpose of it was to deliver the things that we were doing as consultants through a digitized software solution um, and so because we were building these things we actually saw an uptick and people just ready to um, get moving and looking for new solutions to do kind of old things. Um, and so, yeah, I would say like COVID-19 has definitely forced um, our space to pick up the speed. Um, but for those who are entering and finding like difficulty or challenges, it's always about like how you navigate and who are the individuals that you're targeting because there are a number of people with inside of all organizations, but as the same that can be said with business, it's, um, you know, who are the decision makers and um, what do they see? Are they uh, forward thinking leaders, which I feel that the philanthropic space is changing um, drastically. And I feel like what previous, what we previously felt philanthropic, um, the philanthropic space to be very antiquated and dated um, with generally endowments that people have died and they, you know, give out X percentages every year. Now we're in um, the world of billionaire pledges where Mackenzie Scott just gave away $1.6 billion in six months, right? And so yeah. we're in a different world of philanthropy than when we were even like five years ago, to be honest. <laughs> Uh, Savitri, I'm interested. Obviously, you know you're you're in the startup world and you've been building businesses, um, but your focus is in the nonprofit space and and like you said, sort of the digitization and bringing the formation and and compliance and and everything about managing a nonprofit into sort of the digital age. One of the things that's a natural inclination in sort of the startup ecosystem is I'm just gonna I'm gonna form a for profit because I'm gonna build a great business, make a lot of money, you know, sell it to Google and you know that kind of thing. But there's there's you know we we recently formed our nonprofit that we talked about earlier, Launchpad Foundation, using Resilia, and it's an important arm to our business because there are strategic advantages to being a five hundred one c three, right? And, you know, donations into the organization are tax deductible for, for the donors right off the bat. We understand, you know, how nonprofits work. Do you think that more, um, more founders should consider a nonprofit structure because of the tax advantages and some of the strategic advantages? You know, you can still make a living running a nonprofit. And a lot of businesses that may not be... Um, exit worthy, they're not going to have a wealth creation event, you could pay yourself a, a, a salary running a nonprofit and you get these structural advantages of a 501c3. We've got, um, we were approached about using our foundation to accept the donation of used corporate furniture, uh, get the tax write off, 
and donate it to co-working spaces, which actually is sort of a sustainable business model, not just taking a grant and distributing the grant, a sustainable business model. Um, do you encourage, you know, sort of would-be founders to, you know, think about a non nonprofit structure, a 501c3 structure versus a LLC or, you know, uh, other types of sort of capital formation structures? Yeah, I think that it, it always kind of goes along the lines of like, what is the intent of the business? I feel that now more than ever, we have individuals who are really what we consider like social entrepreneurs, right? And so a lot of the work that they're doing and the kind of work that um, the products that they're selling and services they were selling, they would probably do a lot better if they were a nonprofit and would take that same innovation, that same storytelling and actually pitch it to philanthropists and organizations um, who would make donations. Um, and it was interesting because when we were starting out, I think now there's just like a whole new world for nonprofit technology, but um, I, I remember when we first started out, I was like, oh, it would probably be easier for me to raise money as a nonprofit uh, because philanthropists are like, oh, I at this time in my life, I don't plan. I don't want to make more investments, make more money. I want to give away all my money because this is what I want my legacy to be. And so there's like this um, cinnamon in the ecosystem is like, why won't you invest that money in these companies? They're like, no, 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 no. I don't want to make any more money. I my goals are now to give away my money. And so there are a lot of opportunities for uh, social entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs to start nonprofits to access this capital and still ultimately have the end result right of what they're seeking to do. Um, and the other side to that is similar to you. There are, I'm seeing more and more um, for-profits who are creating nonprofit arms. Um, and even like we recently started um, a fund. Um, they A fund that they started a foundation because they wanted to essentially raise capital, which they secured a pretty substantial uh, grant from Kellogg to offer training to women founders, right? And so like, oh, how do we increase this pipeline? We obviously can't do it through a fund, but Kellogg said, well, if you start a foundation, a nonprofit, we'll fund it for you to train the next generation of female founders. And so more and more, I'm also seeing for-profits um, actually start a nonprofit arm to be able to do all, have all these other benefits um, as well as utilize it as a more charitable arm to do different things they generally wouldn't be able to access certain capital for or certain benefits or tax uh, exempt uh, benefits that they would receive if they had a nonprofit. I mean, I think that it, that certainly makes sense. And I, I know in our organization, um, I, I was a big proponent of having this nonprofit side, especially because we saw so many accelerators uh, and other like entrepreneurial centers that would sort of be these nonprofit entities that could didn't have any profit motive. And I think for our regular day-to-day -day business, we like the profit motive because it makes us care every single moment about making our customers happy. Um, but I think it's been interesting. The challenge that I faced from the organization was often um, is that a abstraction um, or B, there's a lot of complexity to managing it. And, you know, I think things like Resilia actually make it a lot easier uh, to get started on it. But sort of how would you um, advise folks from avoiding some of the pitfalls of adding a nonprofit arm uh, to their organization um, and avoiding those complexities that can kind of bog you down, especially because fundraising is not simple. So it's not like you're just automatically going to start a nonprofit and then just the money will flow. Right. Right. Um, so I definitely think that if you have a for profit arm and you start a nonprofit, it would be probably wise to have someone that may have some type of nonprofit background or someone who's just enthusiastic about helping to raise money for a nonprofit, particularly if you're raising money for a for profit. So it's like you don't want to it's probably very difficult to raise money across two entities. And so if you could actually have someone that their focus was the nonprofit, um, particularly if you're looking to raise a certain targeted goal and if you have um, activity that is yearly. Right. And so it's around a yearly uh, something that you're engaging in activity at, for the nonprofit and you have particular goals that you're trying to um, execute or programs that you're trying to create. Um, probably the best way to go about that is actually having someone that just can be focused on that. 
Um, and if you're, say, a founder, entrepreneur, and you have a co-founder, maybe that's say, okay, we're going to really make this a, a legitimate part of our model, then you know this person is operationally focused here, and then the other person is responsible for the nonprofit. But I definitely think that um, trying to juggle both as like just one entrepreneur is definitely going to be difficult, just because a nonprofit is truly a business, and so it would be similar to operating two businesses, um, which we know a lot of entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs do. But um, yeah, if you want to see the most from it, definitely being able to uh, have a, a larger focus on it. And I can imagine as you're sort of evolving the vision for Resilia, things, that marketplace of services and access points, uh, whether that's to, you know, folks who are really good at run fundraising, who can help advise uh, and connect and support startups or different elements. So, so why don't you tell us sort of the future of where Resilia is going um, and how that marketplace is going to evolve? Yeah. And so our nonprofit platform um, essentially is, really devised to help organizational leaders understand how to effectively run a nonprofit um, and everything from the basis of you know starting a nonprofit and the compliance that um, goes into that um, and automating a lot of those tasks so that people just accidentally don't file something or any reports we've automated inside of the nonprofit side of the platform, um, as well as trainings on fundraising, like templates you should be utilizing, um, live webinars with experts um, on various topics. Uh, and so we definitely have created this subscription a platform for the nonprofit side where organizational leaders who have been there for, have been in the nonprofit sector for years can still go and learn um, a lot of key things to move forward the organization as well as educate their team members because everyone essentially has access to it. You can go through a number of different things in our library um, to bring you up into more of an expert level of understanding of you know what it really takes um, are particularly for those who are just starting out and they're like, okay, how are we supposed to be actually organizing our board? How can we make our board more effective? Or, you know, how can we motivate volunteers? And um, that essentially has been the evidence of what the nonprofit platform is. And um, from the enterprise side, what we learned is that grant makers also want their nonprofits to be successful because uh, they will hire us as technical um, advisors to them. And so our enterprise platform connects to the nonprofit platform. And so if you are a Ford Foundation or Oxfam America, who's one of our clients or United Way, um, they essentially issue nonprofit seats to all of their grantees. Um, and because they have the enterprise platform, they can retrieve information, reporting, um, and anything that's really digitized back into their platform as well. That's amazing. Sorry, I guess I'll let you, I'll let you talk. <laughs> um, Sumitra, I want to ask um, about where you are now, and then I'm going to follow up with a question about uh, bootstrapping. But let's talk about venture capital and sort of the, the journey um, that your that the for profit business is on and sort of the, the fundraising ecosystem. Um, you've recently raised your Series A round, an eight million dollar round, which is awesome. And congratulations! I know what that does is it it just you know sets the goal goalpost. So congrats <laughs> yeah. on you know where you're going. Not congrats just on on that accomplishment, but it's but it is an amazing accomplishment. Um, we also have a member in Newark, Ashley Edwards of MindRight, who uh, uh, is uh, has also raised one one million bucks. Um, I don't know if this data is is up to date, but um, you know I know that that sort of makes you two of like last I saw twenty African American women uh, as CEO of companies who've raised more than a million bucks. Um, you know, let's talk about sort of access to venture capital. Um, where do you think things are? There's been a lot of focus, you know, over this year, um, like you said, with the you know Black Lives Matter movement and more venture capitalists understanding the need for diversity, you know, within their own ranks. You know, a lot of VCs look more like me, um, and that's something that, that that's got to change. Um, you know, we're on a journey, um, and where do you think we are, and how fast are things changing uh, as far as you know venture capital access for underrepresented founders, for for women and people of color? Yeah, I think that for me, my journey has definitely been a roller coaster. Um, when I started my first company, we bootstrapped it, and so when I went out to 
actually raise capital, I had um, an MVP, a minimum viable product. You know, we had some customers on our platform. Um, but what I realized really soon was that I didn't have the VC network. I had a business network, but I didn't have the right network that I needed to raise capital. And so that set me out on this path, trying to like fly from West Coast, East Coast, trying to meet um, investors. And, you know, my friend Sherelle always says, she's like, you are like the antithesis to what a, um, a, a tech founder would look like, right? So I'm, I'm Black, I'm female, I'm from the South, which... If you're not from the South, you don't understand how that could be actually a, a, a nudge against you. Um, and so I think that these things are something that I knew would be difficult or right like, challenging, but I didn't know how difficult it would be. And I, you know, read some of the articles and I was immediately like, okay, now I see what people are talking about. Like people are definitely pattern matching. And they're like, oh, you know, this Mark Zuckerberg uh, looking guy walks through the door and he immediately, you know, is funded um, with much less than we had when we were pitching. And I do think that there is a cycle of pattern matching that uh, essentially is ingrained throughout the VC uh, community in which this year with Black Lives Matter um, is seeking to disrupt that. Um, I was on a call yesterday with someone from Blackstone and they're trying to be more intentional about like, how do we start creating a pipeline of there's so much later stage, but are like, how can we get connected to ecosystems that generally have access to diverse communities so that we can support those communities so that by the time a founder can get the backstone, there's a pipeline um, that has been created. And so I think there's a, you know, that issue, just not the networks not being there, the pipelines of um, which impact the pipeline in itself. And I definitely felt that for sure as a founder early on. And so I raised the pre-seed round originally of four hundred thousand um, dollars, and that was fairly easy. Which most founders, black founders, probably would not say that, depending on where they're raising capital from. But again, because I had started a business, I had access to a business community, and so I was able to raise four hundred thousand dollars essentially for people who had worked with me in my other business and felt that yeah, you probably could do something again, right? You might be successful, so I'll write you a check. Um, and they could probably afford to lose it, right? So <laughs> I raised four hundred thousand um, dollars in a pre-seed round, and so when I went out to raise my seed round, I was like, okay, you know, I got my deck. I, we have even more traction, and I basically kept getting like knocked down left and right, left and right. Um, and I always tell people that I have to give credit to um, New Orleans um, startup, uh, so Noe. And I pitched for Coulter Pitch, which I think you might have been there. Yeah, I was there. <laughs> I lost, by the way. <laughs> I know. You know, you know the, the companies that have lost that, Lucid lost, Patrick lost, the companies that have lost that have, have been gone on to be very successful. Sometimes it's good to be the loser. <laughs> Uh, so I won in a different way. Uh, Tim Milliken, who is a partner at TPG Capital, uh, just happened to be on my call because they coach you, right? Uh, TPG associates coach you. But Tim um, happened to be on my call. And after, you know, that Monday, I reached out and said, you know, thank you for all of you guys' help. And Tim actually responded and said, oh, when you're ever in San Francisco, look me up. Maybe we can um, catch up. I thought you had a really great business model. Um, and so fast forward a few months with me going down this treacherous road of trying to raise a seed round. <laughs> I was going to the Bay Area for something else, a conference. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to just reach out to him, thinking this is not going to go anywhere. Um, and, you know, Tim's like a white guy from Ohio originally. <laughs> and so he was like, he responded immediately. He was like, yes, let's get lunch. And because of who Tim was in the VC community, um, he was like, you know what? I think you have a great business. Um, I think we can help you. I think I can help you. I'm going to write a check into your company and you can use my name uh, to, and let other investors know I invested. And that was literally like the fuel that I needed to turn my seat round. And he didn't invest like a huge check. We ultimately raised $2 million, but it was the fact that it was him that invested. And, you know, people often say like VCs are kind of like sheep and follow. Uh, that was definitely a true statement to that. Because like having the ability to utilize um, TPG capital, but particularly like Tim Milliken, someone that was on investment cap 
table. He was so willing to like reach out and vouch for the company, vouch for me as a founder. Um, and we were able to raise the $2 million C round. Um, my series A was a lot easier than my C round. <laughs> but, uh, and we were fortunate to bring the LA group out of Thibodeau on um, as one of our lead investors. And so that definitely is great for the New Orleans ecosystem because we are having more capital that's um, flowing around here. Um, also brought back on Mucker Capital out of Los Angeles. Uh, their, their recent claim to fame was their huge exit with Honey. Um, and so they're great to have on. We also have a major investor out of the Midwest, Cultivation Capital. They're the largest venture capital for early stage um, in the Midwest, um, based in um, St. Louis, although they have offices in like Chicago and other places. Um, and so, yes, yeah, definitely our ups and downs of raising capital. Um, definitely no blueprint that I was able to follow, but uh, here we are. That's yeah. amazing. Well, you're you're a wonderful trailblazer and uh, and setting a great example. Um, I'm okay. So let's back up now. We're talking about you know va raising venture capital and you know raising raising you know the, your recent round. Um, let's back up to the be beginning because you you're you're also um, you put yourself out there in a lot of ways. In fact, you've written one book, and my understanding is you've got another book yeah, another coming one. out in, in March. March. Yeah. So. I know. so you, I Tiff, I saw you mentioned Tiff. Um, I know Tiff yeah. very well. Um, one of her her partner, ironically, is in New Orleans right now, Jabril. <laughs> um, oh, like got her down the budgetista pathway and started doing her ads and show and making her a believer um, to productize her wealth of knowledge in the finance space. Um, and so I actually am not with Pink. She's with um, Penguin, I believe, a Random House which I think acquired Penguin, but I am publishing my second book um, in March with Wiley, um, which I'm excited about because a few of my favorite um, SAS authors uh, from Jason Limpkin over at Saster and Mark Roberts, the first CMO of HubSpot also are published with Wiley. Um, and so essentially I'm talking more about my journey, right, as an entrepreneur, and then my journey raising capital. And so a lot different from Solid Ground, which is focused on um, just being a very like uh, young, wide eyed, 20 uh, something year old starting my first business. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, we look forward to that coming out in March and maybe we'll have you back on the show to, to talk about that. Go ahead. I feel like I interrupted you on a question you had. No, go right ahead. Just just drop in. No, no, wait, not at all. <laughs> um, great. Sorry, I, I didn't expect you to throw it back to me. So there we go. Um, well, why don't you, I love what you guys are doing. And I love the fact that you're making uh, nonprofits accessible. Um, and I think it is, it is, I mean, we've been dipping our toe in the water and it is a very challenging environment to navigate. It's different, right? I mean, but yet at the same time, we were contemplating, we were talking about this last week, which is something that we all can benefit from is actually when you think about being a nonprofit and I, I'd like you to validate, but also provide some sort of perspective for those burgeoning nonprofits out there, which is it actually does come down to understanding who your customer is. And sometimes we get stuck in, you know, when you're pitching a VC, you have to think about what the VC box you need to fit into when you're pitching your customer. Um, you have to think about what their actual needs are. And then when you're pitching in your nonprofit world, you have to think about that. And I think we often get stuck into whatever our paradigm might be. Yeah. So, you know, help us understand and sort of those who are thinking about navigating the world of starting a nonprofit, how to put that customer centric hat on when you're actually going in fundraising. Um, because I think that fundraising exercise is just different than acquiring customers. It's different than raising money um, in the VC world. So just tell us, sort of give us a few tips there uh, that people can kind of take and. Asking yeah. for a friend, right? Asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing that is the same as raising capital that doesn't change in the philanthropy space is relationships. <laughs> so that is one thing that is like uniform, I think, across the board when it comes to um, raising or fundraising uh, for for money 
And but I do think that there are certain other elements that come into play for a nonprofit. And something that I was talking about um, recently was being able to clearly tell um, so much like startup, like telling your story, but also showing information and data and um, reporting the way that funders want to receive it. And so right. I do think that although much different way they want to receive it, like proposals or packaging things that align to um, their in objective, right? So understanding the in objective, our goals and missions of that um, philanthropic organization that is funding or that grant or whatever award it is and being able to like nail it, um, but also communicating um, through proposals, et cetera, the way that funders want to receive it. And so I think that uh, similar to how you're pitching, right? If you're first starting up, you're like, oh, keep your deck this short and mm -hmm. don't put all this stuff on one slide. And, and so it's very similar to the nonprofit space, but very tailored to how they want to receive it. And, um, you know, more academic in, in many instances, if you're talking about like the Gates Foundation. Um, and so you really have to like hone in on who is the individual that essentially is going to be reading a proposal, um, who's gonna be receiving it and understanding like who the committee, who reviews it, right? Who sits on that community um, and understanding like their backgrounds. And so I do feel that there are definitely some um, tricks and tidbits that can help um, push forth one organization over the next, um, but definitely a different method of going about it, but some of the same like theory that you would put into um, raising capital from as a startup as well. Great. All right. Well, I've got uh, a, a quick hit question for you uh, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. We're really grateful for you joining us today. Um, so Mayor Cantrell uh, recently announced that we won't be parading during Mardi Gras. Um, uh, we were we were at Mardi Gras, um, the Mardi Gras weekend sort of as the world was shutting. That was like the last time, you know, we could hug people, be around people, you know, just such a good Mardi Gras spirit. So I'm curious, she was soliciting proposals. That was the one, one of the things that I was grateful for on my list. Going to Mardi Gras? Going, getting to see Harper have Mardi Gras, because who knows what it's going to be in who the knows? future. Yeah. Um, anyway, she was soliciting, uh, the mayor is, is soliciting ideas for how Mardi Gras uh, should be celebrated this year. Um, I think she's sort of said, we're, we're going to celebrate Mardi Gras. Uh, but we're just going to do it differently. So uh, I'm curious if you have any ideas or if you're going to, you know, pr throw something out that you want to propose. H how do you think Mardi Gras should be celebrated next year? Oh, my gosh. It's going to be so different. We're such just creatures of habit. And we're just like, so like our traditions are our traditions and we never want to like part with them. <laughs> I definitely think it's going to be difficult. Um, but, you know, I get probably why she canceled the floats because like, how can you actually uh, even try to manage that? No possible yeah. way. Um, but I do think that what I think Mardi Gras is gonna be like this year is going to be like very much so, hopefully the weather's great um, or decent where people can have their normal like Mardi Gras activities at their own homes um, and with like with few friends and try to do something festive with inside of their own um, space versus like piling out um, at a ball, which I think I think balls are still happening, but it's like social distance, I believe, uh, but no flows, et cetera. So I do yeah. think it would be more of like people in their own space um, and potentially, you know, I see in Lord Garden District, so there's like a little park across the street for me. And so I'm trying to think about like, oh, how can I invite a couple friends over and just like be more festive in my own controlled environment? Now, the reality of that for everybody else, I don't know. <laughs> test and party, right? Test and party. Everybody does a test and then you come together with your pod, yes. Yes. Your limited pod, and you have a good time. Well, my sister's at Baylor Medical in Dallas, and their doctor just told them that they're going to, the healthcare workers there, including herself, will have access to a vaccine in December. So they'll be able to start taking it in December. So you never know, maybe, you know, yeah, be awesome. I'll have a vaccine. But early February, you know, I don't think I'll be doing too much for Mardi Gras um, just because it's such a risk. It's like, yeah. 
I should count my luck for being at Mardi Gras last year and not, you know, getting us, sick. Us too. We year, yeah. Wow, it's good we left on Saturday. I know. You asked me that question yesterday and I just went, oh no, it's canceled. Yeah, I thought but, it was going to cancel as well. Because I'm, I'm like, good. I, I, don't want, I didn't want to play along. I was a bad sport, but I have an idea. All right. Then so I've my, idea. fine, but my yeah. idea is better. Uh, <laughs> My idea would be to, because you know how we've watched Mardi Gras parades in the past? Mm -hmm. And the, I mean, literally, it is the worst. Um, it's it's just the worst production, <laughs> what, whoever does it, right? Like, I, I don't know what they do, but it, it's like I got out there with my camera and they're half in the bag doing the Mardi Gras parade. But wouldn't it be great over just the last Mardi Gras weekend if they created a place that would be that they could actually allow people to parade without throws, without people. They just did a proper video production. I mean, TV crews and broadcast that all over the world with bands and all kinds of things. You could do it in Superdome and people could still participate socially distanced in a parade. And you yeah. take like the highlights of all of the floats because they would never want to pray together, but just do that for Mardi Gras Day and everybody just celebrates Mardi Gras Day around the world. And we have, just like we're having football games, we have virtual parade. Yeah. Um, I, with I'm with you. That, that's kind of that's kind of where I was going. I, I think that uh, Mardi Gras is, is such a unique uh, cultural experience and, and obviously being in New Orleans, um, or other you know parts of the world that that celebrate Mardi Gras and other you know cities around the world that that celebrate it, but nowhere like New Orleans. Um, but this is a great year. Everybody needs a little Mardi Gras, right? It's such a um, sense of community. It's such a time when people you know come out of their homes, get to know their neighbors, spend time, have a little fun, let down their hair. Um, I, I think it's a year for broadcasting that to the world, right? And we're all getting familiar with, you know, Zoom and platforms like this. Um, put some resources into, you know, putting on an incredible virtual concert. You know, music is part of Mardi Gras. You know, maybe there's a way to, you know, in, in New Orleans, you know, create a big virtual concert. Do something that is on a global scale um, broadcast out of New Orleans. Uh, I think the mayor could put some resources behind that. Um, do it in a safe way. And, you know, the world lead, needs a little Mardi Gras this next year, even if it's different. And hopefully shortly thereafter, you know, yeah, vaccine, you know, testing. Vaccine it up. Things are going to start to get better. Yeah, I definitely was like early. I was like, oh, there's no way there's going to be a Mardi Gras. And so when I saw like, oh, we'll have a Mardi Gras, but it'd be different. I was like, big risk. <laughs> yeah. But I like that idea of broadcasting it when I was younger. Um, we used to go to um, Zulu and then we used to come home. We actually used to watch Rex on the TV. And yeah. so it was pretty cool. I mean, that's something that I remember even as a child, like just watching Rex. And because you're inside, right, watching from a TV, you get to see like everything <laughs> and all the costumes and you don't miss anything. Right. That, that's actually that's what you were referring to when we brought our daughter Harper to Mardi Gras this year. Um, she had so much fun. She was catching all the beats and everything. It, you know, rather than putting on, you know, like Bubble Guppies or Pete the Cat or a show on the iPad, we literally would pull up old Mardi Gras parades and she would watch those on YouTube and she loved it. Yeah. So yeah. You know. we should probably pick that, bring that up. Yeah. All we'll, right. We'll at least be watching YouTubes of, of past parades this year. Yeah, right? yeah actually. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, well Savitri, it was so nice to have you. Um, you. Congratulations on all your continued success and, uh, we're excited to stay in touch, continue to watch uh, your progress, and uh, look forward to your book, Resilient, that will be uh, coming, coming out in March. March. Um, here's Savitri's uh, website. And uh, we'll let you go. Happy Thanksgiving, and we'll be in touch. Great to be with you. All right. After Thanksgiving, for our last show of 2020, our friend, uh, and somebody who has worked with us several times around ecosystem building and activation, Andrew Berkowitz, will be joining us from D.C. Yeah. He is a newly named media fellow at the Milken Institute.
and a managing partner at Zwilla Media. He's going to be here to share a secret sauce on how to build podcast brands from scratch and convert them into meaningful commercial business. I could use Maybe some, we'll tips some tips myself. Asking for a friend. Asking for a friend. <laughs> uh, but join us with Andrew. He is a great leader, a great speaker, and honestly, he has really... Uh, track record of getting his podcast into number one slots yeah. on the Apple Podcast Network. So, All right. Well, looking forward to Andrew uh, in two weeks. Um, I wanted to offer one more gratitude uh, before we wrap up here. Um, we're super grateful for uh, the whole team behind Lifestyle Business and uh, Launchpad TV. Um, Dio and Scott, who help us uh, with the booking this season and and the last few seasons, uh, and in particular, Ariel Berenger, who uh, is the production uh, force behind the show and helps us get it together. Every She's week. our Gelman. <laughs> Thank you, Ariel. Um, and with that, uh, hope everybody has a wonderful and a safe and a healthy Thanksgiving. Um, so much to be grateful for this year and we will see, we'll be off next week, uh, hopefully enjoying some Turkey and, uh, then back the following week. We'll with see Andrew. you for our last show of 2020. All right. So long folks. Take care.